Okay, good afternoon and a good morning to our New York colleagues. Welcome to our Detective Insights webinar. Uh, today you will hear from Chief Ortiz, Head of the Special Victims Unit in NYPD, along with Detective Sergeant John Martina, who works with the Chief. I heard uh, Chief Ortiz speak at an event earlier this year in New York and thought he spoke about in relation to detective wellbeing, reward and recognition and some other areas that we will cover later. I thought it would be really good insights uh, to colleagues this side of the Atlantic and I hope you think so too um, by the end. So in a moment I'll hand over to Chief Ortiz and we'll go through a short presentation and then we will have a Q&A session going over a few of the points that I've just mentioned. So if you have any questions for our speakers please raise your hand. We will bring you into the meeting, into the webinar and unmute you, so don't you worry about that. Um, and um, if, you, if you don't want to raise your hand and just want to type a question in, if you've got access to the chat bar, please type the question in there and I will go through that um, when we get to them. Or if you don't have access, you can email our events team at pfevents at pollfed.org. So that's PF for Police Federation events at pollfed.org. Um, at the end of the uh, session, there'll be a feedback slide. Uh, please, please do take your time to fill in the feedback. It's only going to take um, a minute or so of your time. It is really important that we um, receive your feedback so we know um, what you want for future events. There'll be a link in the chat for that feedback or a QR code. And I'll remind you of that a little bit later when we come to it. So, um, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chief Ortiz, um, who's going to go through um, a few points around the Special Victims Unit. Over to you, Chief. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an uh, uh, amazing experience, my first one. So, you know, uh, be gentle, as they say. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, like I said, my name is uh, Deputy Chief Carlos Ortiz. I am the commanding officer of the Special Victims Unit here at the NYPD. Um, just to let you know a little something about me, I'm coming up on about 27 years uh, on, on the NYPD in, in April. Uh, most of my career has been uh, patrol, uh, you know, foot uh, for uh, cop to sergeant to lieutenant to captain. Um, then I was able to do about four years in detective squad and investigating cases in the Bronx and Manhattan. Um, then a couple of years, about two years ago, uh, this opportunity came up uh, to be commanding officer special victims. I applied and, and I was uh, fortunate enough uh, uh, to, to get the position. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of, of kind of the breakdown of, of special victims, um, it was established back in 2003. Uh, since its inception, in, inception in 2003, we've handled over uh, 145,000 uh, cases uh, of sexual violence. Uh, we investigate all sex crimes within the five boroughs of New York City, along with any child abuse cases of, uh, of, of a child 10 years and under. Anything above 10, that would be investigated by the regular uh, uh, detective squads. The way my squads are broken down uh, is we have five boroughs in New York. Each borough has its independent adult side and an independent child side, except for the borough of Staten Island, which is geographically is very small. So we combine we combine those. We also have uh, what we call a transit special victim squad, and they handle all sex crimes uh, within the transit system. And as you know, New York City, we have over five, uh, and that's in transit and also buses. Uh, we have over five million uh, travelers per day uh, traveling through our buses and, and our transit system on a daily basis. Uh, within special victims also, we have uh, small units uh, that also assist in investigations. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to name each one and then I'll, I'll take you through through each one just to, to make it easier. Uh, so the first one we have, it's, it's called an LER IRT desk, and that's Law Enforcement Referral Instant Response Team Desk. We have a ComStat and a case review team. We have a night watch team. We have a DNA cold case slash major case unit. We have an international, national, citywide human trafficking uh, task force. And then we have SOMO, which is our sex offender monitoring unit. So taking you through each, through each one, uh, the first one, LER IRT desk, which is our law enforcement referral instant response team desk. So that's a 24 hour hotline that we have here uh, at the borough in, in, in my office. And they triage any incoming, any incoming calls. And these calls can come from a variety of sources. They can come from law enforcement. They can come from a, a teacher seeing a, a black eye on a child and 
a mandated report, a calling number. We, we've had vic- uh, survivors that actually call the, the, the number themselves. We get hospital notifications. We get rape crisis, line, uh, rape, rape crisis hotline calls uh, through, this, through this. When I first got here two years ago, I, w- I made sure that, that those lines were, uh, were manned by detectives that have some investigative background just because those triaging now uh, gives it a, a lot more, uh, more meat, uh, meat to them. So just to give an example of that, what they would do is if they were to get a call from, let's say, a teacher saying, hey, um, I did see uh, one of my students. He's nine years old with a black eye. I don't know. You know, I don't know what's going on. That uh, desk now would take all the information, who's reporting it uh, and everything else. And they would triage it and then I'll send it to the pertaining uh, squad that it pertains to. Being that this is a nine year old child, what borough is it? Bronx. OK, it would go to like the Bronx Bronx child. So the other unit that we have is a ComStat case review team, and they're tasked with compiling all the data regarding you know, trending sexual assault complaints, preparing weekly reports. Uh, but one of their main uh, focuses is case reviews. So they pretty much look at cases to see the investigative steps that are being step, uh, uh, being taken. Are they proper? Are they missing anything? Or it's a good, bad. Um, and what we do is on a weekly basis, we'll say, hey, this week we're going to take this particular borough and look at their cases and see how they're doing. And we look at open and closed cases. And the reason we've got closed cases is to say, OK, was everything done in that case before it was closed? Uh, is there anything else that may be missing in that case that, that could be done? They they do a report. They send it to myself and my sergeant. And at which point we push it out to uh, our lieutenant's sergeant so they can address any deficiencies or anything within within, within that case. But one of the things that they also do that I started when I first got here is is, men, is mentoring. So uh, just to let you know, each each detective within that unit has minimum of five years in special victims. So they're seasoned detectives within the special victims unit. So when it comes to the mentoring, so I'll give you an example. If we were able to get, let's say, 20 new investigators into, into special victims, I have four of those uh, case review team members. I would give them each five uh, new investigators. And what they do is, it's 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 an eight uh, eight session uh, uh, program. So the first month they meet once every week. The next month they meet biweekly. The third month they meet once, and the fourth month they meet once. So what that does, what what it is, is pretty much that uh, um, detective meets with investigators sometimes in person, sometimes on teams, and they pretty much go over all the cases that they caught that week. Uh, give them advice, say, hey, you know, you may maybe an, an extra video canvas on this one, or you should look a little more uh, in, into this case. Hey, did, did you really, did you run the perpetrator in this, in this system? And that's, so they give advice uh, to these new in, investigators who were just learning uh, how to, how to do invest, investigations. And now within each squad that they go to, these new investigators, they have seasoned Uh, investigators. They have mentors. But imagine how maybe intimidating that could be for a new investigator to speak to somebody maybe in their squad feeling like, oh, well, if if I ask a dumb question, this guy's going to remember for the next 10 years that I'm here. And, you know, when I when he retires, he's going to remind me of that dumb question I asked him when I first got here. Whereas now they have somebody else they can just call on the phone and say, hey, I'm stuck on this one case is there a way you can help me so and it doesn't it doesn't just end after the the eight sessions they have that person's number for the rest of their career they can always call and kind of get get advice on the other unit we have is is the night watch unit so night watch is just like it sounds at night um our our uh, detective squads we end at one in the morning we go end the tour at one in the morning night watch comes in at 11 o'clock at night and they work till eight eight in the morning and they cover anything within that night that comes in uh, let's say uh, uh, we have a survivor that shows up at the hospital at, at 2 a.m. Uh, raped or, or violated in, in any way, Nightwatch would respond. Now, they respond to all five boroughs, seasoned detectives within that unit, and they would start the investigation. They would look for video. They would do the in, uh, interviews. They would do whatever uh, whatever's possible within that time frame because, you know, some things are closed at night. And then what they would do in the morning is, depending on which a squad it goes to Manhattan, uh, Bronx, Queens, they would almost give like a package to that detective that's catching that case. So now imagine you being a detective coming in in the morning, something happened at 2 a.m. and you don't have anything. You're four hours, five hours behind the clock because now you're starting your investigation. No, what you're doing is someone's handing you and saying, hey, this is what we've done. We've done video. We've spoken to to the person that 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 the survivor spoke to. So it's almost like a, a package. So you can imagine the, the benefit in, in having something like that. The other unit that we also have is a human trafficking section. So, and that's broken down into three three sections. We have 
one unit that works with Homeland Security, and they investigate human tra- along with you uh, with Homeland Security. They investigate uh, human trafficking cases internationally. There's another another component that works with the FBI Child Exploitation Unit, and they investigate human trafficking within uh, interstate and also uh, uh, child child uh, crimes against children. And then I have my local uh, human trafficking team that investigates within the five with, within the five within the five boroughs. The other unit that I had is it's a DNA cold case and uh, major case squad, which I, I put together when I first got here uh, two years ago. Uh, their focus is reviewing old cases uh, of which DNA maybe wasn't wasn't tested or maybe with the new testing systems that have come up, maybe you want to retest the original uh, original DNA to see if, if, if we get a, a, a result uh, this time. But their main focus is pretty much uh, they, they focus on complex cases, high Noria, uh, Nor- Noric cases. Um, uh, patterns and things like that, because the way it was before I got here is we do that whole uh, pile on the rabbit type thing. So you'd shut down a whole squad, let's say if an incident happened in Manhattan, um, and you'd have nobody behind handling the cases that are still need to be handled in, in the squad. So what the major case does now is I can focus that major case team and say, hey, go to Manhattan, help out Manhattan with that, you know, big pattern that's going on. And that supervisor in Manhattan now is able to keep some of his detectives behind in the squad, handling their cases, handling the other cases that need to be uh, handled in the squad. So this way there's no delay in in those cases. Um, And the last kind of unit that we have is the SOMO unit, which is the Sex sex Offender Monitoring Unit. Um, We in New York City have over 10,000 registered sex offenders at this moment different levels. We have a level P, which is they haven't been labeled yet. We have a level one, which is uh, one of the lowest, level two and level three being the highest. Each one of those levels has their own uh, uh, reporting requirement. For instance, a level three, it every 90 days they have to come in, uh, take a new picture, uh, make sure the address, the address is good. Um, the other thing that that unit also does is they also visit some of these sex offenders um, to make sure that they're at the location that, they're, that they've registered. If they're not, my, my unit also has made arrest uh, in, in the past. So that's pretty much kind of the, the units that uh, they're part of the special victims and they assist in, in the investigations. So get, getting into our, our, our philosophy, it's trauma-informed, vic- victim-centered. Um, for, for a small, uh, better, better uh, I guess, plain English, it's we make the, we're trying to make the process easier for our sexual, sexual violence victims. We can't control the outcome. We can't control what happens in court. We can't control if we don't have any, maybe less, we need more evidence. We can't control that, but we can control the process. We can control that victim interaction. We can control what evidence we, we, we catch. We can control the communication that we have with the survivors. One of the things I implemented here is a 21 day uh, CV conferral. So if the case is open uh, for more than more than 21 days, I expect my investigators to reach out to, to that survivor and say, hey, how are you doing? Uh, do you need any, any, any services? And also, if, if there's any uh, updates in the case, give them give them updates in the case. It accomplishes a lot of things. But one of the main things is, uh, let's say, for instance, five five months from now, you get this arrest, and now you're looking for the survivor because you haven't kept in contact with her with her or him. You don't know where they live. You don't have a number for them. Now you have this person who who violated them, and, and you have you don't have you don't have the 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 victim. The victim. Um, you know, at the end of the day. The, the victim may not be satisfied with the outcome, but they 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 understand that they were supported through the whole process, and and that's and that's very in, in, important. We want we want to provide um, privacy and safety for our survivors, and make them a part of of the investigation instead of making them feel like 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 they're not. So how cases how how do we receive cases? Um, we receive cases. A lot of variety of different ways. Uh, the, the the desk, the hotline that I told you about, uh, not through 9/11, uh, through the patrol officers, uh, hospital notifications, uh, uh, emails, uh, through the mail, um, advocates. Um, there are times where we have survivors that may show up to an advocacy center and maybe don't want to come into a precinct. Maybe they're intimidated uh, by a precinct. Just, I just don't want to walk in there. We send our detectives over there if, if, if need be. We we have very good contacts with our advocates, um, very good uh, relationships um, that it, it, it's, it's almost seamless. You know, they don't want, we'll come to you. You don't have, you don't, you don't have to come to us because at the end of the day, we just want to, we just want to report it. Um, so going to investigative goals. So they kind of fall under four, four categories. Uh, the first one is gathering the facts. Did we speak to the victim? 
to the witness? Did we speak to the outcry, the person that maybe the survivor spoke to after it happened? If there is if there is a suspect, did we inter, uh, interrogate the suspect? Did we do all analysis on everything, the parties, the locations? If it's a bar, did we run the bar? Is there any previous location, any previous incidents there? Is it uh, an apartment building? Did we run the apartment building? So those things when you cut when you call gathering facts, collection of evidence. Video. Is there video at the location? Is there video of maybe um, our survivor walking home stumbling? Is there video of maybe the survivor walking into a location stumbling? Is there uh, uh, just any any type any type of video? A DNA, touch DNA from the clothes, uh, anything that, that was left behind that we, we can test. Receipts uh, that they that, that the perpetrator pay you know at the location with his credit card. Did they get an Uber? Do we get the Uber receipt? Control calls, control texts. So anything of, of evidence is, is important and will will, will increase the, the prosecution. Third thing is identif identification of, of, the, of the subjects. Do we have a phone number? Do we have a partial name? Do we have anything that we can use to, to identify uh, the suspect? And lastly, it's arrest of the guilty or uh, exoneration of the innocent, you know, if, if, if that's what, uh, what happens. Collaboration. We have we collaborate with a lot of different units. One of the main, a uh, few of the main ones are our five district attorney's office. So each borough has their own district attorney's office. They follow their own different rules. But one of the things that they each one of them do does have, it's a sex crimes bureau and a child abuse bureau. Phenomenal. Uh, it's it's almost like our own, our own, uh, our, our own, in, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, district attorneys uh, to investigate. We also deal with both our, our U.S. attorneys, the Eastern District and the Southern District. Most of the cases that go there are the human trafficking type cases. And then we have our outside agencies that we, we deal with. We deal with uh, ACS, which is the Administration of, of Child Services, uh, Safe Horizons, which provides services uh, to the victims. Um, as a matter of fact, we have a Safe Horizons person installed in each one of our adult adult squads. And these advocates pretty much give uh, whatever they need, housing, uh, child care, whatever our survivor needs to feel comfortable and to feel uh, supported to the point where they're going to continue with, with, with this investigation, we will do. We also deal with the family justice centers. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the issues that we found when I first got here is if, let's say, a survivor were to walk into a family justice center and, and report that they were a victim of a sexual assault, they would have had to go from there to now the squad to to have their story told again. Something that we worked with the advocates is no, that I, I got involved and I said, that makes no sense. You reach out to us, reach out to our to, to me or, or, or my my or my uh, supervisors and we will send a detective there. Why send her somewhere, why send her now where she has to get a car, whatever it is to get somewhere else. So that's something that we worked with with them. We worked with the hospitals, with the SART nurses in the hospital, which is the sexual assault response teams in the hospital. We work with colleges and universities. So there's a variety of different uh, collaborations that we do. Um, the way I look at it, the more tools I can have in the toolbox, the, the, the better it is for, for my investigators. Um, so ultimately, my overall goal, it, 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 it's, it's very simple. You know, it's make the process as easy as possible. You know, we know as well as, as, as anybody else that this is the most underrated, uh, underreported crime that there is. And a lot of it, let's be honest, it's the interactions, and I, and I tell I tell my detectives, and I, and I and I try to tell when I speak to patrol and anything else is we lose most of our survivors within that first interaction with with, with the police, you know, and we want to encourage the reporting of sexual assaults to come forward, and we want them to feel supported, and 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 to the point where they don't say why did I even call the cops. So I know that was a lot, and I uh, I wanted to get through, but I know it's this way. Uh, I think that's. The end for me, and we'll open it up to uh, to questions. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, um, for me, something that really just uh, stuck out for me was you were talking about the district attorney's office and having that collaboration. It's been um, a really long time sitting, certainly in in England, since we've had uh, the opportunity of having a prosecutor in the police station with us. Um, I know there's, there's bound to be some people on the call that um, remember those times uh, along with me. And it was really, really useful to, to have that person there, to be able to go and liaise with them at pretty short notice around cases, or you had that complex case, you you know, just make an appointment to, to go and see them. And, and I think that's absolutely invaluable. One, one of the not, things, Lisa, that we did, that we did since I've been here is we actually hired uh, a director of special victims 
uh, her name is Kathleen Baer, who has a background, who comes from the district attorney's office. She was a bureau chief in a few dis, uh, offices, and she works directly for us. So she's kind of our in-house legal just for special victims. So we can we can go to her, ask her advice, because she's been there. She's prosecuted these cases. She's gone through these things. So that's been, you know, almost an amazing. And also, she has that those relationships within those uh those district attorney's office. So it's invaluable uh, uh, to us. Uh, and again, having those specific um, divisions within those district attorney's office is huge because you're dealing with the same uh, uh, attorneys every day. You're dealing with the same uh, uh, people. My my supervisor, let's say in Queens, is dealing with the same district attorney in Queens in all his cases. So they know each other. They know uh, what what's needed. I, you get to know somebody and you know what's expected. You know, hey, I know they're going to need this. I know they're going to need A, B, C, and D before they want me to call them. So let me get A, B, C, and D done before I call them. Yeah, def definitely. We've had a comment already in the chat, One of the, a question. Do your prosecutors work with your detectives as soon as the investigation begins, or is it after a specific amount of time? It, it depends on the investigation. Um, like We all know no two investigations are the same. If you treat them the same, you've already failed, in my opinion because every investigation needs its own different uh, road for, for a better choice of words. So some we do call them early and some we do our, first we do the legwork and everything else and then we, we will go to them. Depending on the case, every case is treated differently, uh, but they're open to either one. So, you know, they've been with us from the beginning or at the end. And, and, let's, and we have that honest conversation with them that they'll tell us. And, you know, because what I do is every month, I sit down with all the district attorneys and say, hey, what's going on? The good, the bad, let us know. We want to know what's going on. And we, and we discuss things like saying, hey, you know, uh, maybe your detectives are, are calling us too early or they're not calling us early enough. So those are the things that we hash out in those meetings. And, and that's something that we now present to our detectives saying, hey, you got to do a little more before you call them. Or, hey, if you see something that's, that's at this level, maybe you should call them and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. And um, another question already. Uh, 10,000 uh, registered sex offenders is a huge amount. How many officers deal with that amount of sex offenders? I think in the unit, John, we have about 20. Yeah, we have 22 people assigned to the unit. Good afternoon, everybody. Sergeant John Matina. We have about 22 people staffed in our sexual offender monitoring unit. Like the chief had mentioned, there's different levels, different reporting. New York City has some very strict uh, laws regarding registered sex offenders. So we are, we, our operation uh, takes place as a result of those laws, right? So like the chief mentioned, for a level three offender, every 30, uh, every 90 days, they have to come into our office and take a photo. We go out on those, on those visits to ensure that they're living where their registered address is. Even uh, offenders who are not New York City residents are required to check in with the SOMO unit because if you are a resident of New Jersey or Connecticut, which are local states, not New York, but you work in New York City, you're required by law to register with us. So we are constantly monitoring it and we have different databases that do ensure that, like the chief mentioned. So there's a lot of work that goes in that unit. And on top of that, we're handling in the special victims division over 14,000 cases just alone in 2023. Wow. So it, 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 it's a lot. And, and yeah. And, um, you know, it, it can be, you know, it can be a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, I, yeah, the important thing, you know, and, and Chief arrived in 2022 and, and some of what he saw, listen, it's been no secret. There was some struggles in the special victims division in years past. And, you know, the NYPD had discovered that there would needed to be a change made here. And I think when Chief came and was able to peel back some of the surface here, realized there was an issue with overload, the people being overworked, low morale, a lot of issues here. And, and that's been a huge, huge undertaking by the chief and the staff here to try to change that. And, and I think a lot of that has, has definitely resulted in the fruits of the labor here. You you see a much different division than when Chief, uh, you know, arrived. So. And actually, John, that's really timely because we just I was going to come on around sort of reward and recognition, etc. But uh, a question has already come in on an email. Um, what do you do in New York City to recognize hard work, but obviously specifically within your division? That, that, there's a lot of little, little things. And, and, and like I said, in the conversation we had uh, uh, when you guys were, were, were uh, in New York um, and even a conversation we had uh, a few weeks ago, um, you know, we don't we don't do this for the credit you know everyone in, in in these type of of these type of jobs is be doing because of calling we in, we want to do this but a pat on the back is nice 
you know, I don't need it for a pat on the back, but if I get one, I'm going to be happy. You know, you know what I'm saying? So that there's a lot of things that I say we can control at whatever whatever level of, of, of uh, supervision you're in as a sergeant, captain, uh, inspector, chief. Um, there's a lot of things that are within your control. You know, just to give you a couple of examples that, 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 that I implemented here. Um, whenever I, I, I do good work, I actually built outside the office. It's almost like a detective of the month uh, board, uh, one for the ch adults and one for the child. And every month uh, my, my captain send us good work. They send us, hey, this this particular, and I choose between that. I choose one for each side, and I put a picture up. Um, now people do come in and out of this office, and they see the picture up there. They come get the mail. It goes a long way. Along with that, their what the the email that their captain sent me, I take it, I, I print it, and I start and I write on it. Say, hey, great job, uh, phenomenal work. You just saved a life. You know, just a nice personal letter. I put it in an envelope and I mail it to them. Imagine you being a detective now opening your mail and you're getting a, a, a note from your chief giving you giving you there's some that actually have framed those and the reason I do that is that was done for me when I was uh, uh, a sergeant and lieutenant and I still have those that were sent for me by by my chief saying hey great job it goes it goes a long a long way um, what we do with that is also now at the end of the year uh, at the beginning of the year we have an awards dinner where we we honor every one of those awardees for the month we bring them down we bring the families down we have a whole thing at one police plaza the whole auditorium uh we have all the speakers all the, the police commissioners there the chief of department is there the chief of detectives is there what that shows is everybody's involved everybody knows how important this is and and the, the i think the caveat of it all is on each desk we put a little uh pad a little note and spell out kind of in you know, as best we can of what what the incident was and what what they did. Now you imagine your child is sitting there, or your significant your significant other sitting there, and they're reading this thing of what you did. It's like, wow, you did that. It, it comes to understanding as, oh, that's why you had to miss the baseball game, or that's why you couldn't go to the christening, or that's why you couldn't make make the wedding. I understand now. I understand. And they see how important it is, and see their loved one go up there, get an award, get recognized for the work that they do. It goes it goes a long way, you know, and it it, it kind of softens that understanding uh, at home because we know we we are we have these type of jobs where we may not control our schedule. We may come into work that morning thinking that we're leaving at five o'clock and, and something crazy happens and then we're leaving at eleven o'clock at night. And we just told I just told my wife that I'd be there at seven able to pick up the kids for this. And now I'm calling her saying I can't. But why? Well, I have this. But why? You know, it, it's. It, it, it can be difficult. So just things like that. And, and amongst uh, uh, other things, one of the things, and I, John, before you speak, one of the things that we did start last year um, is we have what we call vicarious trauma training that I brought for, for my, my detectives. They're going to have to do it uh, every two years. And because I know for a fact, you know, this, this drains you watching these, these, these uh, cases on a day-to-day -day basis, watching the abuse maybe of a child on a day-to-day -day basis, watching all these things, it does take pieces out of you. You may not think it does, but it does. And I wanted to bring something that's going to help my detectives because at the same time, a happy detective is a productive detective, which means the cases that they're going to bring for those survivors are just going to be that much better. Yeah, and it's also, Chief, you know, do you see these fancy pins we have? A detective can't go buy that. That has to be bestowed upon them by the chief. So every month, every other month, the chief bring down, brings down investigators who maybe didn't rise to the level of investigator of the month, but they still did great work. So he brings them down here as a ceremony. We have the NYPD photography unit come down and he pins these pins on them and they take a photograph and it's just a, a great event for them as well. You know, we try to get as much recogni recognition out there as possible. You know, we have uh, newspaper articles hanging in the office for uh, colleagues to come see when they enter. You know, it, it's just to improve the morales oftentimes as law enforcement professionals we often overlook the morale and we don't realize how important it is to the daily well-being of our our members and, and you know it, it, he's been instrumental to ensuring that that has changed here i think that personal side of things is is really key isn't it and like, like you say chief your your handwriting you know notes and letters to people and you know and being that person actually pinning that 
that pin onto somebody. And I think that personal element um, goes a very long way. Now, we've got a couple of people with their hands up already and some more questions. So, Lisa, can we bring in uh, Simon, I think, has got their hand Simon. up. Simon, you're unmuted. You're telling me Simon, you're unmuted. Okay, Simon. I'm unmuted. Is that working? Yeah, yes. you're <laughs> live. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I just find it really interesting to hear what you were just saying about morale boosting and sort of keeping people happy. I'm I'm also interested to hear that was I right in hearing that you have to be a detective for five years before you could apply for a job in special victims? No. no. So what it is is for that particular unit that I have, which is the case review team that does the mentoring. I want a seasoned detective doing that, teaching the young to get into special victims. You can you you just apply now. What I do my I do every interview myself, and the reason I do every interview myself is because I, I look at what you've done on the job. But I also want to know what you did before you came on the job. So I look for as social workers. I look for people that worked with children. I look for school teachers that maybe had professions before they came on the job. What you've done in the police force is very important. But I also look at for a well-rounded person. And the other thing that I really look for is that conversation that I'm having with you. Because if you're the, the way you're speaking to me at this interview is how you're going to speak to a victim or survivor. And I want to know that you have that. I can teach somebody anything i can't teach you empathy you either have it or you don't some people are very robotic some people are very just just cold and i just can't have that you know uh, someone in my unit because it's it's going to show but yeah you can apply uh, most of the people that a lot of people that we get are usually officers and then in 18 months they wind up becoming detectives um some are young we usually wait you have to be about five years or four years on the job like a police officer uh but as for a detective you within special victims, some of the units, like my major case team, so the prestige units within special victims, I require that you have at least four to five years within special victims. So not on, on the police force, but within the unit. And do you struggle in recruiting into into special victims? Well, yeah. in, in the job itself, uh, the NYPD has struggles when it comes to recruiting. When it comes to special victims, um, I'd be honest, I haven't seen it when it comes to special victims. And, and a lot of it is, you know, the type of work that we do um, is a calling. The type of work that we do in special victims, you have to want to do this uh, because you have to understand that the cases that you're seeing, it, you, you're seeing the most horrendous cases. I always use the example, someone that's a victim of a car breaking, someone that's a victim of, let's say, they, they, they stole all four rims and they come out of their car and, oh my God, my, my rims are gone. They can go tomorrow, go to the tire shop, get their rims. They can go to uh, uh, motor vehicles, get their license back that are stolen in the wallet, uh, uh, you know, from their wallet. A victim of our particular crime will never be the same. We have, we, I, I use the example, of, uh, we had a young lady who's walking into her building. She sees a, a, a person outside. She thinks, hey, maybe he lives in a building. I'll be, the, I'll be the good person. Let him in. She lets him in. He drags her out of the elevator on the third floor and winds up raping her in, in, in the hallway. She will never be the same. We arrested him the next day. He's he's in jail, but she will never be the same. She should be safe. She has made it home. She went out with friends and she made it home. She should be safe. You see what I'm saying? So the, the a lot of the people that we get here um, want to be here. So, so far in the two years that I've been here, I think I've been overwhelmed with applications and people that want to come in. But I, and even in those interviews, I'm very honest with them. And I told them, and you know, some of my executives that sit in there with the interviews sometimes tell me, hey, you're kind of cruel. I said, I'm not cruel. I'm just honest with the person. And I let them know, hey, this is not for you. Um, maybe you should be better at a regular squad or you just need a little more to, to come in here. Um, because I always end my interviews with saying, if, if ever I was in this position, I want to be honest with the person that I interview. I think it's 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 the right thing to do for you to leave this interview knowing how you did, if you really want this, what you need to do to to accomplish it, uh, and things like that. Yeah, and I think what's important is I think overall we can all probably agree that law enforcement as a whole is struggling to recruit people. So we've actually seen the opposite, as Chief alluded to. You know, the NYPD struggles to recruit, but us in the Special Victims Division are seeing such an uptick in applications. And I have to be honest, I, I, I attribute it to morale. Our morale here in this division is much higher than overall in the department. And I, I think that plays a huge, crucial role in, in the recruitment. 
aspect of it. Of, you know, a big a big issue. So I've, I've worked in our version of special victims, I suppose, in my home service. And a big issue in our morale is caseload <laughs> versus investigators. So, and I, I just wondering how many in total, how many investigators of all rank have you got? And how, what's the average caseload? That's my last. I've got a thousand questions. No sir. That's my last question. I won't no hold problem. the mic. No problem. So pretty much that's a very phenomenal question, because when I first got here, um, that's one of the things that I saw, because, you know, I did uh, an assessment of, of, of the whole unit when I got here, and they were drowning in cases. And you could love this all you want. If you're drowning in cases, you're going to drown. <laughs> no, no matter how many uh, floaties I throw at you, no matter if I throw you, you're going to drown. So one of the one of the things I have to say, and, and I've, I've been very supported by my, my higher ups, my chief of detectives, the commissioner, is they made it a point of making sure that, that I got I got the, the the people that I needed. I think if I'm not mistaken, when I first got here, there were over, John, about 100. They were catching yeah. about 100, 100 cases, over 100 cases a year per detective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've almost dropped it in half. Yeah. More more reasonable. We've increased the manpower. I think we're up to almost, what, 300 and? Yeah, over three. We're about 350 of all ranks. And, Chief, like you mentioned, when you arrived, there was somewhere. And this is just our adult and child squads, not factoring the specialty units. But our caseloads were about 100 cases per year per detective. And the chief has been able to bring that down to somewhere in the high 50s to mid 60s, depending on each squad, which has definitely loosened some of that, you know, wear out and burnout in the squad, which I, I agree with you helps morale tremendously. Okay. Right, sorry, Thanks. Austin. No, that's like that's like okay simon thank you and uh, you did helpfully ask a question that's in the chat as well so we covered <laughs> off um the the caseload etc so i'm just going to just go through a couple in the chat and then we'll come back to some hands that are up um so do you pursue many victimless prosecutions so the evidence-led prosecutions um because there's an this is this is an area in england that we attempt to do for safeguarding of the victim and the wider public so we a lot of that we do in uh sex trafficking does a lot of victim and stuff but within our within our own unit um let's be honest here uh this is this is a survivor run organization when the survivors ready to tell their story they will tell their story they may not be ready to tell their story at that moment that does not preclude us from doing investigation uh so Let's say, for instance, we may show up at a hospital and the survivor is saying, why are you here? I want nothing to do with you. We do have some information in regards to that case, and we will do what we can uh, up to a certain extent where we can't do any further. Do we have the location where it happened? Hey, let's go over there. Let's let's talk to the bar. Do we have the person maybe the survivor spoke to, 911 caller? We can reach out to 911 caller. Because how frustrating it would be for you as a survivor, let's say, for instance, for 10 years, after 10 years, you go, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready to tell my story. And you call the police and they've done and now you're looking for video that's 10 years old you're looking for instance so we do as much as we can um uh, uh, at, even though the person may, may not want to go forward but we do enough of as, as, as obviously to a certain extent because we can't do anything further or there's been times we have no information so there's really not much we can do but i expect my my detectives to do as yeah. much as they can and an interesting stat that we've been keeping track of since chief ortiz arrival is uh, delayed in reporting, right? So sex victims, uh, sex assault victims are much different than any other crime, right? If you walk into a New York City precinct and you want to report that your home was burglarized and you want to tell them it was burglarized 10 years ago, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to tell you leave. That, we're not taking that kind of report. We take reports of sexual violence as far back as 20 and 30 years. You can, there's no time frame. So when we see an uptick in reporting from older incidents, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that's a positive sign for us. That shows people are more inclined to come forward. They want to speak to the police. And that means what we're doing is working because if you're now after 20 years willing to come forward and tell your story, you've, you're comfortable now. You're seeing something that's encouraging that. And, and as much as that may increase statistics for us, it's a welcoming sign. And, and you know, we appreciate that and, and, and know that, that some of the things that we've implemented are working. Um, it, the figures you, you mentioned earlier about the number of cases that your teams carry are, are really quite significant. I'm just curious as to how your detectives operate and whether there's a, a, a marked difference between our countries. Do your detectives operate as more like case managers where they will task out actions and, uh, and, and sort of receive the information back and collate it? Or are they going out and, and really doing those inquiries directly yeah. themselves? 
Yeah, they're they're responsible for the case. So in other words, they're case responsible. Um, the only units that probably are, are not case responsible, like the night watch unit that I that I explained, or the major casing, they uh, uh, they assist in those cases. But each squad um, catches their cases. So at, at, for example, you, uh, the, the the lieutenant or the sergeant walks in that morning, they receive let's say ten cases that day. He will assign it to those detectives that are working on that tour. Uh, he may give one one person two, may give the person three, may give the person uh, two and two. So it, he'll he'll spread it out amongst them, and they are case responsible. So they'll do all the the video canvases, they'll do all the in investigation, along with other other people within their their squad to help them out. So if they want to do a video canvas, they may grab somebody else and say, hey. While you're doing yours, I'll do mine. We'll go do our, our video canvases yeah. together. But they are responsible for that case. We do have some ancillary units, like you know, the, like Chief mentioned, the, the investigator is responsible for his case. He's going to do the uh, interview. He's going to do the evidence collection. He's going to do all of those steps. However, when he's est established probable cause and he's ready to make an arrest, he may notify the, the NYPD warrants unit. That's who would pick up the the perpetrator. Or if he needs help with a social media run, we have an NYPD smart unit who he can task with that to provide that information. So for specialized uh, operations, we have certain ancillary units, but the case detectives are responsible from the case from start to finish, pretty much. Superb. Thank you very much. Um, one follow up question, if I may. Um, what sort of how long do your cases generally go on for? What's your sort of time plan that's occurs? I know it's how long is a piece of string, but it, it depends. Uh, some cases are longer than others, uh, you know, because remember we also catch cases where where we are an arrest has already been made and we're just enhancing the case uh in order to help that case in, in court so there's some cases they go that way those are pretty quick and then there's some cases they may last a long time you may have a pattern that's going on uh they may last a while or you may even have where the perpetrator has left the country so that case is it is, is still open it's it's not closed so every case can can vary and i think i think anybody who does sex assaults understands that you know so to say the unknown or the you know the stranger assaults we're able to get evidence quickly and gather them and piece that together are, are probably our most more difficult cases end up being the known twos or the relationship ones where there's one side of a story another side of a story we know sex happened it's just determining the the all the other evidence which takes longer multiple interviews multiple evidence uh, inquiries so those sometimes take even longer than we would when we see a normal you know stranger sex assault yeah. And, and, and just let you know, no cases are ever closed. So even though, let's say, for instance, you may have exhausted all leads at that moment, um, at any moment, you know, that survivor victim may come up. Hey, I, I just remember this. Every case can be reopened um, uh, unless it's like an arrest made. Obviously, if it's arrest, it's, it's the finale. But those cases, even though we may close them uh, uh, letter wise, they're not at any point. They could come back and open. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I might just ask a quick follow up question um, on sort of timeliness. How how quick do you get uh, cases through the court system um, so victims aren't, aren't waiting, you know, one, two, three years like they are here to give evidence? Yeah. Again, we we have no control over that. Um, uh, we try to give them anything they need. And like I said, that relationship that we have. With the, with the attorney's office is, is huge because with all the discovery laws and everything else that have passed, they need a lot of a, a, a lot uh, from us. And we make sure that we give them everything they need to, to have a case that, you know, go forward as quick as possible. I have a question for you, actually. Is that is that one to three years post COVID or is that pre COVID? Is that something that hasn't changed? Like I, I can tell you in New York City, there was a backlog following COVID that is still trying to catch up to on a lot of investigations. So what may have taken much shorter prior, we're seeing a delay in that. So I was just curious if, if that one to three years is, is the same number it was prior. It's it certainly got worse since COVID, but that we were still waiting, you know, well over a, a year or more to um, to get to that final hearing. Um, and, and of course, you know, victims become disengaged, et cetera, as, uh -huh. as time goes yeah. on. No. Yeah. Okay. I would say it's similar here. We, we, there is a, a, a by the time the investig by the time the case hits the criminal justice system in the in the court, by the time it's actually finished, could be that one to two to three year process. Absolutely here. Same. Okay. Okay. Um, now I did have a Steph. You had your hand up earlier. Do you still want to ask a question, Steph Dyer? One of my great forum members. Do you want to pop your, pop your hand up again so we can find you? Okay. 
We'll just unmute you now, Steph. Okay. We should be able to hear you, Steph. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Hey, thank you. Um, you probably have already uh, answered my question, actually, because um, I, I put it up when you were talking about um, uh, staff in the offices. And I, I wanted to know how you were actually managing to do that and actually get people in uh, in the door, people wanting to work for that department, um, because we're definitely in a position where people are being made to go in those departments and, and I, whilst I wholeheartedly agree with your approach and it absolutely should be something uh, uh, you know an area of business that people want to work in um we just well we just don't have that option because we just haven't got enough people wanting to go in there because of the risk that's involved and the stress and the trauma attached to it so uh Although I know what you're saying with regards to um, the morale and, and that plays a massive part in terms of the actual work, we can't pe get people to take on that sort of work. It, it's like I, like I always say, you know, there's things you can control and there's things you can't control. Like I can't mm -hmm. control promotion. I have no control of promotions. I can send names, but I don't control who gets promoted. You know, I, I give them my 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 uh, my opinion of, of maybe this person is better than this, but I don't I don't control that. But I can control a lot of the stuff, uh, you know, awards, you know, making sure that they're feeling, you know, the caseload drops, making sure that they're feeling, you know, to the point of saying this is I, I'm good here. I, I'm I'm doing a, a good job um, and it's going to take time. It's like anything else. When you're turning a boat, you you're not going to turn it that second. But you will see and you, you just got to keep implementing, implementing those those processes, implementing the, the letter writing, implemented that, you know, I visit mm -hmm. I visit my detective squads. I go in and I speak to the detectives. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing? Um, you know, I sit down. Hey, any questions, any concerns? Listen, you're speaking to, to the person that's in charge. You know, not many, not many times in a lot of professions, you get to speak to the person in charge. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty open. You know, I tell, hey, whatever's on your mind, let, 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 let's work on it. And and again, you're going to have people that are going to be like, yeah, I don't know. This, this just seems weird. And, you know, you never did this before. You know, what, what are you after? Um, but again, you have to keep you have to keep at it um, in order to get that that boat turned. Um, and, and it is frustrating and at the beginning. You know, listen, I saw it here when I first got here with my case review team for as an example. You know, there was a lot of animosity be one detective to the other saying, hey, why are you looking at my cases? You're just a detective just like me. Mm -hmm. And as the time went on. They realize that hey, they're looking at it to help me, not to, not to hurt me. But again, it's it's something that, in time, it kind of feeds off each other, and then uh, you, you'll see the difference. But it, it's it's not something you're going to see overnight. And I think that making you know making our unit so to say attractive and and more attractive than other units. You know, it has to there has to be buy in. If you don't have buy in from the entry level supervisors and up to the executives, you're not going to get the investigators to buy in. And if nobody's buying in, you're wasting your time. You know, if they don't feel supportive, if they don't feel like the risk is more worth the reward, then why would you come here? If I'm a, a, a new investigator or I'm a young officer, I want to go somewhere where I'm going to feel supported, where I have opportunities to grow, where even if I don't love the work, but I, I, I feel that the risk is worth it. I'm going to take that chance. And and if you ask two, two and a half years ago prior, the the applications were not flying in here like they are now. So it, yeah. it's the change of the overall mentality of the entire unit that has to shift. And like the chief said, it's not going to happen overnight. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steph. Um, we're going to move on to another Steph, Steph Plowman. We'll just um, get ready to unmute you. Oh, I think you need to put your hand back up, <laughs> Steph, if, you, if you're there, so Lisa can see you. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, whilst we're just uh, waiting, Steph, if you want to ask your question again, just pop your hands up in a second. But we'll come to Tracy Ruff. Tracy, we'll just um, unmute you now for your question. OK, we should be able to hear you. Tracy, you there? Hello. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realise I had to do something as well this end. Um, oh, okay. So my question is just in relation to when somebody wishes to become an investigator, 
what do they need to do? So I'm a patrol officer and I want to become an investigator. Do you have to do exams? Do you have to do particular training courses? And when you do become a detective, so a little Mm -hmm. extra question, when you do become a detective, is there any financial reward for becoming a detective? So um, your first question, there's really no exam or anything. There's a few things that I look for when I interview this. There's a couple of systems that we use. If you're familiar with them, it helps. Um, but there's, it, it, it's, um, I look for uh, a variety, wide variety of things. Like I said earlier, I look for what you did before you came on the job. I look for what you're doing on the job also. Are you very active? Are you, you know, in, in units? I look for a lot of domestic violence officers because they're already dealing with, with, with this stuff. So there's a lot of different things. Once you're in here, I have multiple trainings that I built here. Uh, in, in order to to make you succeed, I'm, like, and I tell my detectives and my investigators, I'm going to give you every tool to succeed. If you don't succeed, that you know, I'm going to keep trying until I realize, hey, maybe this is just just not for you. Um, I don't know. What was the other question again? Now is the salary after you get promoted? Yes. Yeah. So good. so after if you come in here as a PO after 18 months um, of investigation, you get promoted to detective. It is a, a little bump uh, in, in salary. That's a detective third grade. Everything after that is discretion. So you you can get promoted to detective second grade, which is a bump, and detective first grade, which is like the most prestigious uh, uh, in detective area. Most of the movies and TV shows you see is detect the old detective first grades. That, that mm-hmm. that's what they, they usually use. Um, but that's all discretion. Like I submit names. Like I'll submit people that have had a lot of time in the unit that are successful that have been doing really good work. Um, but now that's that's one of the things that I don't have control over. Mm-hmm. Um, but I let my detective know I submitted your name um, and they understand that, hey, you know, I, I, I'm just glad you put me in the game. It's like like lottery. I'm, I, he's in it to win it, as they say. Yeah. Um, so those things are, are the ones when it comes to other outside salary, there really isn't. Mm-hmm. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll just move on to uh, Jennifer Peterson, who is online. We'll just get to you, Jennifer. OK. We're ready when you are. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Um, afternoon, both. Um, I um, am a detective inspector in uh, effectively the equivalent unit of yourselves. Um, and one of the um, the patterns that I've noticed, especially in our force and probably nationally as well, is that we are recruiting directly into the detective role. Um, And part of that is that um, I get officers who have been taught the very basics out on the street. They have to sign it off once and then they come directly into my specialist unit to investigate um, child abuse, serious sexual offences, you know, vulnerable adult abuse, child death, etc. So it's all merged into one in my force. My perception is that I think that that is the worst thing that you can do for the detective. I think we're we're devaluing the department. And and I think the the knock on for that is that we aren't attractive as a department. I think when you've got a a workforce that is is very young, um, we, you know, we I often refer to them as green because they're very, very young in service, you know, and they're effectively having to learn on the job. Um, having listened to yourselves about, you know, the, that you look for that skill set, you look for that relative skill set, bringing in those outside um, kind of skill sets as well as the internal skill sets. From your opinion, the way that we do it with the direct entry, do you think that that is effectively a, a bad idea? Well, it, 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 I guess it, it depends. Like I know um, Sometimes you have no choice, you know, like you're saying, you may be at, at, a, at a crossroads where that's that's what's coming in. Um, and if that's what's coming in, then you kind of have to, like I always say, adapt. You may have to build something where uh, a mentoring type program or something in, in that sense where you may have to say, well, this is what I'm getting. I have this. This is I have no choice what I'm getting. How can I melt? How can I help them succeed? What do I need to give them to increase their productivity, increase what they need um because i also saw that here and and at the beginning when i when i first got here when you were getting maybe the wrong people applying or you just weren't getting that that well-rounded rounded person and that's kind of where my mentoring program came in um because you know unfortunately uh like with, with our department we're a very young department um you know we, we're, our recruitment is very young and unfortunately you know a lot a lot of what we're getting now is twitter officers you know, they know how to tweet, uh, 
but they may not know how to walk a foot post. Um, so, you know, we have to kind of adapt to, to what we have. And I, that's why I, I made the mentoring program because I wanted to make sure that, you know, we see them. And there's been times where, where people have, maybe I have, I've had to extend the mentoring program because maybe they need a little more, uh, a little more, but I think it, 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 the other supervisors have appreciated that um, because they see that, you know what, there's somebody else that's helping me with this, with this young officer. It's not just on me. So in other words, you may have a supervisor that you just say, okay, well, you know, the they gave us this guy, now he's yours, you know, fi- figure it out. Whereas now there's they're they're being supported by the overhead command, and for the supervisor, let's say in Queens, he says, thank you, you know, I, it's not just me. I see everybody is kind of helping, uh, you know, with with this person. I don't know if that. We struggle with a lot of that, too. You know, uh, we're getting those direct from patrol, no prior investigative experience. We're having to teach them from a very young age. That, that's no different from what we're experiencing. But I, I think something that you also have to consider is like the chief is very big on what what is applying for us. We're not getting applications from senior investigators who have 10 years of rank. We don't want people here who don't want to be here, who don't want to do this type of work. It's counter benefit to us. It doesn't work to bring somebody in here to do these type of investigations just because they were a detective. We were, you know, the chief's uh, uh, side has been pretty much, I rather teach somebody who wants to be here. I rather teach that than, you know, than try to break bad habits of a senior investigator or something like that just because they're an investigator. It's worked very well for us. Uh, yeah, the the NYPD as a whole is young, so we have to take yeah. what we have. Yeah, and, and the line I always say is, just because you're a detective doesn't mean you gotta you gotta come here. You know, a detective, okay, fine. That means you, you worked 18 months and you became a detective. That doesn't make you uh, someone that's good for special victims. Uh, but again, in, in your case, you have to kind of analyze each each person for what it is and be honest and say, hey, you know, this this may not be for you. And there's been, you know, since I've been here, I, I have had those conversations with detectives that were already here and saying, hey, this is not for you. But but I've also had to move a couple of people that have asked me say, hey, I can't deal with this anymore. I can't see another child, but I don't want to leave special victims. Is there somewhere else I can go? I can go to the LER desk. I can go to the sex offender monitoring unit or another unit um, where I don't lose that person because he's a good person. He just cannot see it anymore. And we do have that. Um, and that's why I, I brought in that vicarious trauma training that I do every year. And just to extend on that, do you have any civilians within your team? So we have what we call pit, um, civilian investigators. So they're not warranted officers. They're not they're not they can go, go out and arrest someone, but they can investigate crime. They can interview perpetrators and, and assist uh, assist warranted officers with searches, etc. The, the only civilians we have in in our squads are like the payroll. Uh, they do uh, the payroll for for that unit, and we do have advocates stationed in some of our our squads, and that's more for services. Um, as a as as a victim survivor walks in, uh, they automatically see those those Safe Horizons uh, workers, and that's kind of just to extend services. But when it comes to civilians, no, that we don't have civilians. It's all uniform uh, uh, officers. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Now, we are a couple of minutes over time at the moment, but there are just a couple of uh, questions in the chat that I just want to go over, if, if I may. And we've still got a few minutes. Thank you. So just to go back um, slightly the, around uh, something we discussed around sort of the criminal justice aspect of things, we've got uh, an issue at the moment um, over here around prisoner uh, prison capacity um, with very few um, spaces left within our prisons to remand people or, or a sentence. So what's your capacity like in prisons over there, if you if you know? And also, yeah. if someone is sentenced to 10 years, do they serve 10 years or a, a particular uh, amount of that? Yeah, we, to, to be honest, we don't really uh, fall under that, that category. We don't know that, that information. And usually that's something that's kind of out of our, our purview uh when it comes to like how, how much they serve or wh- whether they they go on parole probation or things like that there's been a, j- a tremendous uh, dynamic shift though you know in, in new york city as far as you know how we now keep prisoners or prisoners who go away to you know to prison or jail so to say uh, we don't you know there's been a, a huge undertaking by the government to, to not have as many criminals in there and give them opportunities to come out so what we see is repeat offenders continuously being locked up over and over and over again. And that's something that we struggle with right now. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. So um, we, we've covered a bit of that vicarious trauma that, that already, because um, there have been some questions around how do you um, identify an officer, one of your detectives who might be struggling mentally because of their work, or is, is that picked up through um, that, that well-being every year or so, or is that through supervisors, etc.? Right, a lot of it is through the supervisors, um, and, and, and that goes with empowering your, your supervisors. You know, I, I've been pretty good with empowering my supervisors to say, hey, you can come to me and, and, and we can talk. Um, you know, I, I always say, you know, I like I also interview supervisors and I give them the scenario of saying, hey, you know, uh, we the, we looked at some cases and this detective is not, you know, working up to par. OK, now what would you do? And what I the first thing I want to hear from that 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 supervisor is asking the detective, are you OK? Are you going through something? Is something going on? Because if you still see a change in, in a detective, it may not be that they're just not cutting it. It may be something going on at home. We're all human. We, we we're not robots. Uh, you know, things do affect us. So a lot of the times it's through the supervisors um, and also other detectives that may that may say, hey, you know, something's going on with my partner and, and, and things like that. And I guess that that's kind of like uh, other ways, other ways to look at it, because, as you know, a couple of years ago, we did have I think it was two or three years ago, we did have a bad string of, of suicides. Um, so we got to make sure that, you know, we take care of ourselves. We, we can't we can't help others if we don't if we're not helping ourselves. Yeah, thank you. And um, and also we've we've got um, a question. I think Lisa, could you sorry, just go up a little bit for me. I remember seeing um, one. I think it was around sort of the, the social media and um, whether that impacts a lot a lot on on the type of offences that you're investigating. Yeah. So so, so I, go John. Uh, so. I do the Twitter account for the special victims unit. We get some complaints that come in there. We, we put up wanted flyers. We get tagged in videos all the time. We investigate everything that comes through. If, if Even if it uh, most of the time it's very limited information, it'll be a video and we have to backtrack our investigation to determine where it was to try to contact who posted it. But we do see stuff come in through, through uh, social media. Okay. And thank wanted flyers posting them on the social media have been successful for us. We do get people who contact us who see that those posters and want to report that they have information regarding it. Yeah. And, and it also gives the, the public say, hey, you know, in this area, this happened. So it gives them awareness of, of, uh, of what's going on in the areas also. Okay, thank you. And um, John, I know when we spoke briefly a, a couple of weeks ago, you you spoke about a few things that um, some that the chief implemented as as a result of feedback, maybe from yourself or a, a colleague um, in in the unit. So, and I think part of that was around the mentoring. But are there any other um, examples that either of you can think of around a staff member has come to you and said, can we maybe try this in a different way? And that's been implemented. So so when chief got here, you know, there's middle management and there's executives, right? So when the chief arrived, I met with a lot of the sergeants and lieutenants and, and hearing them out and listening to what they their concerns were, listening to what the problems were. You know, listen, we're all uh, professionals. We all understand. Sometimes guys would sit here for 20, 30 minutes and just, you know, tell me all these problems. But they wanted to be heard. They, they wanted to say what their experiences were and what they thought was working and not working. And the biggest adjustment here has been Chief Ortiz willing to listen and willing to implement ideas and not say, oh, no, no, if I didn't think of that, I'm not doing that or uh, that's not it. He's willing to listen. And you know what's great about what he's done is he's he's evolved, right? So if we start something and he brings something to the table, he's always evolving. it. He's always asking for feedback. He's including the management, including the supervisors in to hear about. It. Is it working in your squad? Is it specific to your squad? Is it specific to the division as a whole? They uh, People want to be heard. And if they feel like they're, what they're speaking about – will see changes and will be implemented, they're much more willing to come forward. So if you have a team, a, an executive team, who's not willing to hear from the, the boots on the ground, so to say, you're not going to get what some of those problems are. And, you know, my phone's always open to the to the supervisors to call me. Let me know what the problem is. Do I have to filter some things out that shouldn't make it to the chief? Absolutely. Certain things shouldn't make it to the chief. Certain things are my responsibility to deal with. But if we bring certain ideas and certain things to the table for him, he's very much open to listening and to hearing things out. And that responsiveness has been very beneficial to us. Yeah, and, and, and it goes it goes back to empowering your supervisors. You empower your supervisors, they're going to go back 
they're listened to, and in turn, it's, it, it's, it's almost like it's going to flow down um, because now now they're, they have bought in. You know what? This is where I want to be. And because negativity also flow, uh, flows uh, downwards also. So, again, it, it, it all goes back to, you know, simple as a happy detective is a productive detective. And in, and in turn, it's going to give a good case for our survivor victims. And you don't realize the little things like the chief mentioned, and I can't stress it enough. The little things we control as supervisors have such a tremendous impact on our staff. The little things we can do, whether it be guys who need a day off, guys who need to leave, little things. We're all human. We all have lives. Those little things make, have such a tremendous impact. If people are working hard for you, if there are small ways to reward them, you have to take advantage of it. As simple as remembering a birthday and having a birthday cake. Doesn't take much. It takes maybe what fifteen dollars for the cake and maybe like two dollars for the candles, and then happy singing a happy birthday at work. It it goes a long way. We don't know what's going on in some of these detectives' lives. They may not have a cake when they get home, you know, or they may not have different things. It's it's. I always say, you know, sometimes as supervisors and ex executives, we kind of throw our hands up in the air and go, oh, I can't control that. I can't. There is so much within your purview that you can control. Uh, and, and, and you can make a difference. Is there things that are out of your control that, that, that make you scratch your head? Yes, just like here with promotions. I have no control over promotions. But again, I can control how, how you feel when you, when you come into work. That's, that's great. It, it's, so, it's so refreshing to hear what, what you're saying it really is. And there's just one more question and then um, sure. we'll, we'll close off. So um, as the questions come through on email, um, I understand the USA has an intelligence agency and Bureau of Investigation, etc. cetera. Um, I just wondered how effective your team find information sharing with other law enforcement agencies and third party partners, um, especially in relation to children and those looking to work with vulnerable members of society particularly the, the USA is so fast. Chief, I'll jump on this and then it's all yours. That way you can. We met with Moldova yesterday in an, uh, New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. That is an advocacy group. And I'm not, and not speaking from my words. This is the director of that group who is not a New York City employee. But she told the contingent that two years ago, two and a half years ago, there was no relationship with the Special Victims Division. If you look at today, we do groups together. We meet regularly together. There's been so much collaboration and that has improved every relationship and that has improved the overall response for survivors. You have to be willing to speak and you're going to be called out. You're going to be told things you don't like to hear, but you have to listen to it. You have to be responsive and you have to work together collaboratively. It's the relationships are not going to change overnight, but you have to continuously work at them. And that's yeah. something Chief has been instrumental with us. With us. And, and the one benefit of, you know, and not every agency has this at the NYPD, uh, we are so vast. Our our intelligence unit is phenomenal. I think it's it's one of the, the best in, in the world. And the collaboration when it comes to things like, let's say, for instance, uh, computer crimes that we have uh, under the NYPD, that we can reach out if we have computer issues. There's so many different aspects within the division itself. But what we've done is we haven't just pigeonhole ourselves with just within the department, we've actually expanded to our advocacy groups. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the things that our advocacy groups came to us is saying, hey, we have had some issues with survivors, victims walking into precincts and just feeling intimidated. Imagine you're a victim of a sex crime and you're walking into a precinct and let's say you, you're, you're a, a, a female that just got raped and all you see is male officers standing around. It could be very intimidating saying, how am I going to tell my story I, I, and walk out? And one of the things that and it came from our from one of our groups is saying, hey, how about putting a barcode, uh, putting up a, a, a sign with a barcode in front of the precinct where if a survivor walks in and says, oh, my God, and then sees the sign, they can scan that. I think we're up to almost 53 pages of services from that barcode. I know they, they have it in two languages uh, now. And again, that's something through collaboration with our with our uh groups that we were able to put up. They brought it to us. We brought it to the commissioner and they were more than happy saying, why, why, why didn't we think of this before? And we were able to put it up in every police precinct, every uh, subway uh, police precinct and every housing police precinct. And it's something that now we are pushing out to possibly schools, possibly different other locations where let's, let's, I, I go back to what I said in my presentation. This is the most underreported crime 
there is. And a lot of it is the fear of getting labeled, the fear of getting judged, the fear of saying, maybe I did something wrong or maybe I deserve this. No, we have to be able to give give our survivors kind of their life back and however however method we can. If it means them scanning a barcode and, and, and on their own time looking at the services and saying, hey, this fits me, then that's that's what we have to do. Oh, thank you. So um, we're going to we come, come to the end now, unfortunately. I'm sure we could sit here for certainly the rest of our evening, but it's going to take up your afternoon now. Um, so thank you very much. A massive, massive thank you to you both for giving up your time um, oh, today. Um, and uh, everybody online, if, if you enjoyed it, do a little thumbs up or send a heart or whatever. That that will be great. Um, the the session has been recorded, so we're just going to do a few little edits and bits and pieces. Um, so for those that haven't been able to at attend, etc., everybody, we sent a link out, and um, you can you can rewatch or watch um, again, etc. So. Um, and Claire, I'll, I'll leave my, my contact information. If there's some follow-up questions, I, you don't have to bother the chief. I, you guys can reach out to me and whatever I can help answer. Oh, or, you know, please, we really, I personally appreciate you bringing me on and, and giving me an opportunity to speak about the tremendous work. And, you know, chief, I'm sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things I, I always say that um, when, you know, people can read through nonsense and, and you know when someone's genuine and you know when someone's living it and you know when someone kind of, lives what they're talking and 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 it comes across and we love we love what we do first of all we love being cops you know uh you know since i was a kid that this is where i wanted to be and this is what, what i what i've done um but you know anything that we can do to help help others and and encourage you know uh uh, uh help our survivors in, in every in every in any country it, it doesn't matter I, I think you know we'll be willing to do yeah that's great thank you there's so much that that you do is transferable to over to here or sort of any profession so that's absolutely amazing so thanks again for your time um and thanks for the offer john and any further updates and questions we'll we'll get them over to you no yes, problem um Claire, claire's just popped a, a, a link into the chat um for everybody if you're able to do the feedback that's great or here's the a qr code on screen it really doesn't take very long at all, uh, just a moment or two of your time. And um, we do really, really need your feedback, uh, particularly when we're looking at other events in the future, the sort of thing that um, that you you want to, to see us do. And um, thank you very much again, everybody. And there's a, a big, just a big massive thank you in the, in the chat um, to all that made this event happen. So, yeah, thanks very much. Oh, but thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. You we'll be in Thank touch you. soon. All right. Be safe care. out there, everybody. Thank you. Yes, be safe. Bye. Take care. Bye.